Welcome, my name is Tim Nott. I'm a veterinary ophthalmologist based in um, beautiful Gloucestershire in the UK. And I'm talking to you this evening about how we image the equine eye using our smartphones. I've been interested in photography most of my life and uh, had a career spanning interest in, in ophthalmology. To be able to combine these two passions is um, a privilege. Um, to, to be able to do so. And the more time I spend with my patients and the cameras and the photographs we take with all of our patients now, the more convinced I am that we can really add to the um, uh, enjoyment of being a clinician, but also the effectiveness we are as, as, as clinicians as well. We can pick out lesions we wouldn't otherwise see, we can document them, we can share them with our owners and get engagement. Client engagement is key to good outcomes, particularly in complex equine ophthalmology case which might need long and uh, complex treatments. Um, so it's uh, we really, really can make us better clinicians and do better jobs for a better job for patients. Most often asked what's the best camera for taking pictures of the eye and uh, the answer we usually give is the one you have in your pocket and the one you know how to use. Whichever camera you have, uh, however rubbish your mobile phone is, however poor your, your digital camera is, and a little bit of ingenuity you can take and really useful clinical photographs. Uh, I do use a digital SLR and I use a prime 50mm lens and extension tubes, which is a really economical way to get beautifully um, beautiful macro photographs um, using the pop-up flash on my camera. Um, realistically though, more and more for most of my clinical patients, um, clinical cases, sorry, I will use my iPhone or an iPod touch or, or an Android phone, but a smartphone of some sort. Uh, photography is much more than just finding that one lesion and taking a nice picture to show your show your own or your colleagues attached to clinical records. We really use it as a clinical tool. We start off with standard photo documentation for all our patients. So in the same way as a five stage veteran, you may decide to take a series of standard orthopedic x-rays or a dentist in the spinal world, you might take a series of standard dental x-rays. We take standard photographs of all of our patients, and those include not just photos, but video documentation of our vision assessment, which for us involves ground level obstacles, which are different colored poles, uh, using a sort of uh, behavioral blindfolding technique. So you use just uh, one item to walk over the poles, and also dropping cotton balls, and then a testing, which we do through um, three separate visual fields. We want to identify a patient easily, so we'll photograph the entire patient and dense documents, which helps in uh, visual assessments for purchase exams. Then we then we see the document, the uh, the head. We take a front-on view, looking for I did see both eyes, looking at the eyelash angle, which is important, documenting ocular discomfort or paralysis. Ideally, try to get both to be two reflections. This we're a little bit close to this horse to get that. Then we take a lateral view from both sides where we'll look at the anatomy of uh, the ear carriage um, and the bottom of the jaw, as well as the, the um, position of the eye and the skull. Then we look at each eye and document those individually. We use the digital zoom on our smartphones to get, the, uh, get as close as we can and, um, and remaining in focus and then zoom to fit. So the eye will fill the picture, take a lateral picture, a caudal and a cranial picture, aiming to skyline the, um, the cornea and look at the end, hopefully um, see the anterior chain nicely. Then we proceed to the next of the eyelids. Really important place to look is underneath the upper and the lower eyelid. These are the windscreen wipers of the, of the cornea, if you like, and lots of pathology gets missed. So a very, very good place to look. Uh, easy to avert with your thumb uh, on the upper lashes or lower, lower, lower eyelid margin. And then of course, uh, the third eyelid to examine and the medial curricular area where you might see foreign bodies discharge or even uh, in worms. And we'll turn the light on on our camera, um, our camera phones. We'll come on to that later. And that's a very important way, important um, tool with our arsenal, if you like, is to be able to use the light whilst taking photographs. That allows us to get this distant direct view, which is very similar to using a uh, drop top thermoscope. Where well, light bounces off the funders and highlights lesions in the cornea. As you can see there's some mucus and mucus on the cornea and the corneal ulcer, um, uh, as well as allowing us to assess how transparent the, the visual corridor, the visual axis is, the way the light passes from the outside of the funders. So we do a distance directly laterally, so we get this lovely yellow reflex. We'll then um, 
can we look at the cranial, the exocranial cordally and take the same view. Then we, then we drop down so beneath the horse's eyes so and look upwards and get an inferior view. And hopefully any lens lesions will move around during that process and allow us to, to identify them. At the same time, we can then get a sneak preview of our retina. So a mandilated um, pupil, no AP blocks, no sedation, uh, with light on our camera phone, just getting close enough, focusing at infinity, we can get a quick peek of the retina. As this voice image here shows us, we can quite nicely see the optic nerve at the retinal vessels um, with that simple technique. Now our next job is to document pathology. So this particular case, uh, sensors for cataracts, obsession for cataracts for cataract surgery. It's a bilaterally blind horse. We can see in the first picture we've got a small anterior lens capture capacity, which is highlighted by the light having coming from the side. You can see the reflection of our modeling light here, which bounces off the front of the lens to give us this lovely white anterior lens capacity. We then use the distant direct technique, which we'll talk about later, where we have light coaxially, so light turned on our phone, which then now highlights not just the anterior lens opacity, but this large posterior opacity and these equatorial vacuoles. We use a slip lamp routinely. Uh, this is actually a slip lamp uh, adapter attached to a pen torch, which allows us to see the cornea, the anterior chain, the front of the lens, and that small white lesion there is its anterior opacity, and the larger white lesion is the posterior opacity. Then we get closer and we can see the reason this horse presented uh, was not presented blind was not due to his cataract because of the total retinal detachment we sadly can see. This means that for every um, lesion, every um, case we see, we generate hundreds and hundreds of photographs, potentially, um, um, which can make trying to catalogue them very difficult. So this is just one case here. We can see our, our cotton ball testing. We can see our pole testing, our rattle, our rattle images, our distant direct images, our slip images. Um, so what really helpful uh, when you first start off using your camera as a, a clinical tool is to start off with good habits and manage your, manage your photos well. So luckily there's lots of good software on the market, iCloud and Google Photos particularly are very good at managing your photos. This is I tend to use Google Photos uh, and then your my phone is set to upload my photos automatically to the cloud. Um, and then once I've finished, I can go and look at the photos on, uh, online, either on my phone or the computer. And each, each, each image, if I wish, I can actually add specific information to the automatic information I added is the location and time, which is very helpful. But the green is where I practice it in the cosmos. So it's. Um, so here we just highlight it with this week, we put a patient name and we just see this equine fundus and then this is a monotic fundus in this case. We can then search on these keywords should we choose to. Now we're not always organised enough to, to label all these all our um, images. Um, so luckily the software packages can give us lots of help. So Google Photos is very good automatically and uh, knowing which place you live, you work at or you go into the photograph. Also it can recognise certain people and even certain animals. Recognize when my little dog, the Dexter, there, um, and can recognize colors. So, when we come to search, we can search for all gray horses in 2018 and it will look through us. It will try and find everything, everything recognizes a horse, which is helpful to find those cases. Um, this particular case here, I, Nelson, my colleague, was holding the horse, so I could ask him for Nelson with the gray horse and it finds all the horses which Nelson was with me in those photographs in, in, in that year. And if I search for melanoma, and if I've used that, any image I've used that as a keyword, it will find all the horses, uh, all the patients with melanomas in. So a very useful way to, to think about how you manage your photos before you start. <laughs>